Well, it is no secret that it's Christmas time once again. I'm excited about it. My kids are excited about it. I know that you're excited about it as well. Let me come around these wonderful poinsettias. I'm joined by a plethora of plants here today. And man, they look beautiful. But it's Christmas time. And, you know, timing, I believe, is something that is not only important in our own lives, but it's important to God. And we can see that timing is important to us because for many people all around the world, but especially, you know, here in the America, we have a lot of loved ones who are going to be traveling all throughout, you know, the holiday season. You might have some loved ones, friends, family that are coming in town visiting you, and you're excited about it. You might be going to visit some friends and family and going to see them, and hopefully they're just as excited to see you too. <laughs> Amen. Sometimes the relationships can be a little complicated, you know. <laughs> Mixed feelings, but that's okay. And so, you know, as in traveling, if you're going to do air travel, you're going to the airport, you're going to fly, fly out somewhere, maybe you have a connecting flight. We know that timing is important, right? You don't want that first flight to be late because you don't want to be running through the airport trying to get that connecting flight. So timing is important. When you're having a child, you're having a baby, timing is important. You want that baby to grow to full term, but also when it's time to have the baby, you want to get to the hospital in time, right? And, you know, true story, when my youngest child, Lily, was born, we were in the hospital. We were in the hospital room. All was well. You know, we had been there. Nikki was in, I don't know, maybe eight hours of labor or so. And when it was time for the baby to come out, she kept telling the nurses, like, go get the doctor. This baby is about to come out. And they were like, yeah, okay. <laughs> we'll let him know. You know, the little wave off, the little casual wave. And so she was like, no, no, this baby is coming. And I said, Lord, please don't let my baby be born on the floor. <laughs> I mean, I would assist, but there was a lot happening right there. Thank God my mother-in-law was there. She said, Nikki, I'm not going to let this baby be born on the floor. I said, go ahead, praise God, do what you got to do. <laughs> but the doctor came just in the nick of time and, you know, within like three minutes, there was Lily. And so timing is important, right? When you're buying a house or when you're buying a car, timing is important. Sometimes the day of the week, the week itself, the month, the time of the year, the season, you want to get the best deal, amen? Come on, we want to get the best deal on those kind of things. So timing is important. Well, you know, timing is, can be everything. I mean, even as recently as last night, my wife, Nikki, she is a fantastic cook. But timing is very serious to her. And so when she's cooking, she asks everybody to start coming to the table and getting ready, sit down about five to six minutes before she's done cooking. And sometimes when I'm in the uh, kitchen helping her cook as a good husband, <laughs> she'll say, shout out to the husbands who help their wives cook or cook themselves. <laughs> she'll say, hey, can you call everybody to the table? And I'll say, why? You know, you're still cooking. I, like, you still got some time. We got five, ten minutes before this thing is over. And she'll say, no, I need people to be seated at the table when the plates are being put down because timing is important to her. She wants all the temperatures to be exactly right so they are consumed at the right temperature so we get the desired outcome. Somebody say timing is important. Turn to your neighbor say timing is important. Turn your other neighbor, the good looking one, say timing is important. <laughs> timing is important to us. And I believe timing is important to God. And the supreme wisdom of God can be shown oftentimes in how we see events unfold in our lives. The supreme wisdom of God is shown and how we carefully crafts our lives, being the architect of the timing of many events that we experience in life. And we know that we have faith, so faith reaches into the eternal realm, right, and grabs what is needed for right now. How many of y'all know faith is now? So we don't have to wait on time to be able to get healed. We don't have to wait on time to receive of the promises of God because they're in the 4D, they're in the eternal, 
and we can take of that healing now. We don't have to wait for next year. We can receive healing right now. Amen. However, there is a sequential nature of events that happen sometimes in which God is the author of and time is very important. Or rather, should I say, timing is very important. Today, I want to talk to you from the subject titled, Moving at the Pace of Grace. Moving at the Pace of Grace. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1. It says this, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Timing is important. We understand that there's a purpose to the timing that we experience. As a matter of fact, Genesis 1, it outlines the creation story. And we see on the fourth day that God created seasons and he created time. He didn't create time as a container for himself or a container for us, but he created time as a way of a sequential nature to have events happen in sequence. And so we see, you know, creation and then the creation of man. And then in Genesis chapter 3, we see the fall of man because Adam and Eve sinned. They ate of the fruit. And God said to the snake, to Satan who had deceived Eve, you are cursed. And in verse 15 of chapter 3 in Genesis, it says this, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is a foreshadowing of Jesus coming into the earth, that through God's divine wisdom and supreme plan, he already had a plan of redemption immediately after the fall of man. That plan's name was Jesus. And so after this, some scholars, they believe that there's over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that prophesy about Jesus. That's a lot of testimonies about Jesus. That's a lot of prophecies. And I won't go through all of those, but I want to go through just a few because it says in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 in the New International Version, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Now, he says Bethlehem Ephrata because there was different Bethlehems, just like Springfield is the capital of Illinois, but there's different Springfields in the United States. But when I say Springfield, Illinois, you know exactly where I'm talking about. So he was very specific in saying Bethlehem Ephrata. There's only one location that he's coming out of. And then another prophecy is told in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. It says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. What does that mean? God with us. So this gives us another key about Jesus. He's going to be born as a virgin, and he's going to be among us. And then it continues to go on in chapter 9 of Isaiah. It says this in verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This word government 
In the original translation, it actually translates dominion. So when we think and see government, don't just think, you know, politics. Think dominion. Because what Adam did gave dominion over to Satan. He, he, he lost his rule and authority. But Jesus was being born in the earth to get dominion back. And not only for him, but when we partake in his crucifixion and in his sacrifice, we receive of Jesus. It says we are then joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So we now share in that dominion that Adam lost in the garden. Isn't it a brilliant plan of God that he worked over centuries? Now that sounds great, right? Adam lost dominion. Jesus is coming to establish a new government to get dominion back. So what happens after that? Nothing. Nothing. After the book of Micah, the last book in the Old Testament, there was 400 years of silence. Ten generations, generation after generation after generation, 400 years where God, excuse my English, ain't saying nothing. <laughs> we like to hear God speak, right? We get a little frustrated when you're like, God, what you saying? We know we're not hearing you. What are you saying? Say something to us. 400 years of silence. But this shouldn't have been a surprise because actually in Micah chapter 5, verse 3, that very next scripture, in the CEV version, it says this, the Lord will abandon Israel only until this ruler is born and the rest of his family returns to Israel. It's in the book. Say it's in the book. It's in the book right there. Maybe they thought he was joking or something. I don't know. Or maybe they didn't anticipate that it would take this long. And there might be somebody here who's able to relate to that. That God gave you a word about something. But yet it's just taking a little longer than expected. Waiting for the manifestation of that prophetic word that was given to you. And you're waiting for it to be fulfilled. But then in Matthew, God breaks his silence. Because the birth of Jesus Christ happens. A miracle is performed. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 25, we see that Mary brought forth her firstborn son and called his name, what? Jesus. But I know the question that you have. Why wait so long? Like, was 400 years really necessary? Really, let's, let's ask these questions. Like, like, why did it have to take so long before Jesus was born into the earth? Well, I think we can find an answer in Galatians chapter 4. In verse 4, and I think this might give you maybe some answers as I speak this morning about some things that are happening in your own lives. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5, it says this. But when the fullness of time had come. Say fullness. Fullness. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. This word fullness, it means completion. It means when the conditions were right. This Greek word for time, it's chronos. It's where we get our English word chronology. And this word chronos, it means in sequence or a succession of moments. I want you to write that down if you're writing notes. Time means a, or, or a succession of moments. It means sequence. So what's important here is I don't want you to think duration. I want you to think sequential. Don't think duration, think sequential, okay? If you look at a clock, we'll take an analog clock. You see an analog clock on the wall, and you're waiting for it to be 11 o'clock. Maybe you have an appointment at 11 o'clock. Well, 11 o'clock a.m. can't arrive until 10 o'clock a.m. has come and gone, right? And then 9 a.m. before that and 8 a.m. before that, 
Because it's not about the duration of time, it's about the sequence of time. Because in order to arrive at a appointed time, it must be sequential in nature. So it's talking about sequence, the sequence of things, sequence of events. And sometimes we're waiting on God to do something for us and in our lives we're believing by faith and faith is now. But sometimes the sequence of events even leading up to it are really important to God because God's ways are precise. His ways are precise. Let's see a couple examples of this. And Human beings, it's no mystery that human beings had existed on the earth for thousands of years before Jesus was born into the earth. But what's crucial to see is not necessarily the time involved as far as duration, but it's really crucial to understand the population of the world. See, the Population Reference Bureau estimates that the number of people who ever lived on this planet is about 105 billion people. But what's important to note is that only 2% of them were said to be born before Jesus was born in the earth. And researchers say that God's timing couldn't have been more perfect because Christ was born at the exact right time and showed up at the right time right before the exponential explosion of the world's population. Somebody say timing matters. It was prophesied that Jesus would be the son of David, right? In Bethlehem, Bethlehem was the city of David. He was even born in the city of David. So we had to come through the lineage of David. So it was important that Jesus not be just born to any family. He not just have any kind of father, Frank or Joe or Al or Jaden or whoever. A Ray Ray. I mean, he can't just be born to anybody. He had to come from Joseph because Joseph was of the lineage of David. And we see it prophesied in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12 and 13. I won't go there. But even in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, um, we see that it was said, if you could throw that up there, that it starts in Matthew, that the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, as it says, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then you can read through the genealogy right there. Another point that I think is important to think about is the culture at that time, cultural context. What was the culture that Jesus was being born into? Now we know that before the Roman empire came and, and came into power, we know that there was different empires that were ruling, the Persian Empire and, and other different empires, but I think it was important that the Roman government was in rule because it had to be a government that ruled by power and authority. Now, I know a lot of governments rule by power and authority, but I think it had to be a government that ruled using martial law. They ruled using violence and sometimes extremist measures. It had to be a government that was, that was not only intimidated by Jesus' coming, but would be threatened enough to do things that were very violent and extreme. We can see this in King Herod's response when he heard word on the street that a new king was being born. And what did he do in response to hearing that Jesus was being born? He ordered all the male children, two years old and under, to be executed. Every single one. Sound extreme? It's because it was. But I think God in his ultimate wisdom knew that he needed a government that would ultimately assist in the crucifixion of Jesus. And there's many other things that I could keep going on and on about that are clues and context things that point to why Jesus had to be born just at that time. And the dispensation of the law came to a close when Christ was born. And so the fullness of time now had come. So I take that to mean that the conditions were right when the succession of moments were completed. The conditions were right 
when the succession of moments were completed. The dispensation of the law came to a close, and his birth, Jesus' birth, marked the dispensation of a new time, the dispensation of grace. And notice God didn't forget any detail in the flawless execution of Jesus' birth. No detail he forgot. Jesus was not born too early or too late. Come on, somebody help me. He was right on time. Don't you love when God is right on time? They used to say in the old church, he may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. He's always right on time. Luke chapter 2 and verse 11, it says this. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. God's plan was moving at the pace of grace. Not too slow, not too fast, just right. And I believe that God is always moving according to his divine timeline. There's always a sequence of events that are happening in our lives, whether known or unknown. And we just have to continue to have faith and trust in him that everything is working out just the way it's supposed to. And even though the enemy may be trying to fight us, we have to fight to maintain our belief that God is in control of this. That I put my full faith and confidence in God. My wife and I have had the pleasure of finally this year moving into a new home that we built from the ground up. Praise God. Amen. It was a fight of faith. So grateful to God to be able to do that. It was so special. And every time I pull up to our home, I'm reminded of just the faithfulness of God. But a long story made short, you know, there was things that had to work out in our favor. It took us a while to find the right land when God had actually put this in our heart to build our own home. It took a while to find the right land and then we found the right land and we put in an offer. We wanted to buy this piece of land cash. And don't you know that the enemy was trying to be at work? He was trying to get busy. And he had the person who was trying to sell it take it off the market. I know. I said, the devil is a liar. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And his mother-in-law. So, you know, sometimes you want to get mad at people, but I say, it's not people. That's the enemy. He's whispering. But I said, if this is for us, we have reserved it in the spirit. By faith, it's reserved in the spirit for us. Nobody can have that land. He can't even hold on to that land. So he's got to give it up. We sow the seed. We sow to give up that land seed. Amen. And once you know, just some short months later, put it back on the market. We were able to put in our offer, secure that land. But that wasn't the end of the process. It was a nice checkpoint to say, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. But then there was a whole other process. And finding the right builder and this and that and and, you know, you secure your, um, your construction loan. And, and you know, it, it was a long process. And from the moment that God had put it in our heart to the moment that we actually, you know, got the keys to take possession of our home, I mean, that was several years. It was a process. But God was working out according to his divine timeline. And sometimes we're tempted to think that a delay is demonic. And sometimes the enemy does try to resist us, and so we fight the fight of faith, amen? But sometimes it's not a demonic delay. Sometimes it's a divine rearrangement. And so in securing all of this and, and, and getting our construction loan, don't you know that by the time they were saying, okay, uh, Nikki and David Winston, you're approved. Go ahead and build your house. We got the lowest rate in history. <laughs> Couldn't have timed it any better myself. Wow, look at that. 
Now, maybe you might say, well, hey, Pastor Dave, that's great for you, but I'm in a little different situation. I'm in a situation where maybe things are tight. Money is tight. We're just, you know, believing God week to week. There's a story that our pastor tells. I love this story. Now, I was just a little shorty at the time, but I heard him tell it. And I like to trust that I was in the car with him as this was happening. He tells the story about when we were back in Tulsa. God had put on him and my mother's heart to sow a seed of food, of groceries, to someone in need. And so they bought some groceries, loaded them up in the trunk, and started to drive around. And just being led of the Lord. And stopped a few places. And this was many years ago. Stopped a a few places, asked a few people, hey, do you know somebody who needs groceries? And you know how folks are. Oh, yeah, my mom needs some groceries. Oh, my auntie needs some groceries. Yeah, we need some groceries. Uh Uh-huh, that's, yeah. But it didn't quite bear witness in his spirit. And so he said, okay, okay, I understand. But they kept going because they want to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost. And they came to a housing project in the north side of Tulsa, which was the hood at that point. And they asked somebody, hey, do you need somebody, or do you know somebody who needs some groceries? And they said, oh, yeah, you're talking about Miss Love. You know, she's up there on such and such floor. She needs some help. So they went up there. Dad knocked on the door. And they opened the door just to crack. Say, yeah, what you want? Who is this? Said, well, my name is Bill Winston. I'm a preacher. And I was told that you need some help, so I got some groceries for you. She flung the door open. (laughs) Said, you just in time. Come on in here, preacher. He said, you see these kids? And there were several kids lined up, and they were sitting all on the couch. See these kids? These are my daughter's kids. She's on drugs, and... I'm helping her out. I'm I'm trying to help them, but we don't have anything. Come, look in this fridge. She opened the fridge and there was nothing in it except a jar of water. And the kids kept asking her, saying, when are we going to eat? We're hungry. And all she continued to tell them, all she could tell them, was God is going to take care of us. Don't wait. Don't don't worry. You know, just just know that God is going to take care of us. At any moment now, God, he's going to take care of us. Can you say right on time? He came just in the nick of time. Obedience puts you in alignment with God's timeline. Obedience puts you in alignment with God's timeline. I met my wife just at the right time. You came to this ministry just at the right time. I believe we started the Operation 10 City campaign, glory to God, just at the right time. God put you in this earth just at the right time. God put you in your family just at the right time. Or God had you start a family just at the right time. God put you at that job just at the right time. God might have had you put the house up for sale just at the right time. He might have had you start that new business just at the right time. God may have you waiting to get into a new relationship because he's having you wait just for the right time. And sometimes natural conditions don't always indicate God's perfect timing. How many of y'all know that sometimes naturally things are happening and, and we can't quite see and discern with our own natural senses that this is divine timing at work? But it is. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 in the NIV translation. It says this. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now let me give you some understanding. 
Mary was a teenager. And she was engaged, which was not unusual at that time for that culture. She was engaged, and her and Joseph were living apart. She had been visiting her relatives, so now when she comes back to Joseph, she's visibly pregnant. She's showing. Come on, get with me here just for a second. Y'all acting like this is normal. Like, mm, uh huh. Come on now. You show up, and she show up, and it's been several months, and now she got the bump. <laughs> you like, hold on now. <laughs> Hold on now. <laughs> like, what you been doing? What's going on? <laughs> and according to the law, the old law, he had every right to break off the engagement. He had every right to divorce her. Let me go one step forward. He was actually within her rights to have her stoned to death. Wow. But an angel appeared to Joseph and explained what was going on. And all Joseph had to do is believe. See, every plan of God always has a supernatural element to it. Every plan of God. And there always has to be an element of belief in the midst of something that's hard to believe. That's faith. That's faith at work. And now that they had the situation, they had to be willing to endure public embarrassment. It's likely that everywhere they went, Mary would be glared at, she would be questioned, she would be ridiculed, she would be accused and chastised for becoming pregnant before her marriage. She would go to the synagogue on Sunday morning and go to Harvest Restaurant after. And she would hear them whispering. You see, you see that Mary? Look at her. You see what Joseph did to her? They, girl, they're not even married. <laughs> and then on the other side, they're saying, word on the straight is it's not even his. <laughs> then after that, they get done and then they do some grocery shopping over at Living Fresh Market. And they're walking through the aisles, getting their groceries, putting the stuff in the cart. And they say, look at that, look at, ain't that Mary? Wasn't she just visiting her family? You see that belly? So now they have to be willing to endure ridicule. So Joseph gets done with that, and then he wants to go hang out with the guys and watch the Bears game. Go Bears. And he walks in the room, and they're like, oh, Jojo, what's up, man? How you doing? It's good to see you. Man, I heard your girl pregnant. I heard it wasn't even yours. Like, oh, man, man, you know, this... It's a whole thing. It's, they said, we, we heard she going around saying it's God's son? Imagine for months having to hear this. You have to be willing to endure the discomfort that comes with walking by faith. Are you willing to stand on what God told you? Even when it's a little embarrassing. Are you willing to endure what it takes to carry full term? Man. And then notice, Caesar happened to call for a census once Mary's just about ready, just about full term, Caesar had the nerve to call for a census. The first census in Roman history gets called the week that Mary is due. Now Mary, 
She, come on, ladies. Y'all know. She, she now nine months pregnant and Joseph talking about some get on the camel. We, we about to go down the street. Right around the corner, as some of y'all say. We about to go around the corner to Bethlehem, Ephrata. Man, we got to go back. So now Mary has to make this journey over to Bethlehem. The timing was the most inconvenient timing that you can imagine. But it was necessary for Jesus to be born exactly where prophesied. (laughs) Write this down. Enduring the inconvenience was necessary to fulfill God's perfect plan. Enduring the inconvenience was necessary to fulfill God's perfect plan. And sometimes what we view as an inconvenience can be God realigning us to his purpose and his timeline. And if we're not in 4D, come on 4D, if we don't stay in 4D, staying spiritually sensitive to what God is doing, then that inconvenience could prompt us to get in the flesh and start complaining and start negating what faith is trying to deliver, what faith is trying to do, because the enemy is trying to infect your faith. We got to keep our mouth right. We got to keep believing what God said and what he prophesied, what God told us in his word. And in the midst of us building this new house, me and my wife, my family, we actually had to downsize. We sold our house and downsized to a tiny two-bedroom condo, two-bedroom apartment for a year and a half. And our youngest two, they had to share a room. Now, these two kids have grown up blessed in which they never knew about sharing a room. They had always had their own rooms. However, we're all close in together today and for the next year and a half. And I'm going to tell you, you know, we had to, you know, park outside and walk and it was, there was many inconvenient features of it. But yet we had to keep our minds fixed on what God was helping us to construct what God was doing, what God was building. And every time I would get a chance to go and and visit the the site where our home was being built and even walking through as it's being framed and and walking through as it's being drywalled and, and walking through as the foundation is being poured, I get this jolt of joy, this jolt of energy because the vision is now renewed. I'm reminded, yes, this is what we're sacrificing for. This is what we're going through the inconvenience for. And maybe somebody here today needs to be reminded of what God is doing. Instead of going by your feelings, looking at the circumstances, why don't you walk by faith looking at the promise? Amen. Let's go to our last scripture this morning. Psalms chapter 37, verses 23 in the New Living Translation. Come on, we're moving at the pace of grace. The Bible says this, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. Are you the godly? He delights in every detail of their lives. So if you're the godly, that applies to you. God delights in every detail of your life. No stone unturned. There's no detail too small that God is not concerned about. And one of those details is the timing of the steps that we take. It's not just about taking the step. It's about taking the step at the right time. Divine timing is God arranging favor on your behalf. Divine timing is God arranging favor on your behalf. And as he does, your steps will be ordered of the Lord. God's timing is so powerful and so potent that he'll even use your enemies to be able to facilitate his will and purpose in your life. 
We can see this with Jesus. But as he lived, now his enemies finally caught up with him, right? We'll say caught up with him, but we really know that it was Jesus yielding himself to the plan and purposes of God. And now the enemies, they thought that they had got him, but what God did is he actually allowed the enemies to be used to facilitate and assist in the plan of God being accomplished in the earth. They just assisted Jesus to the cross. Notice this, they, they didn't just put him at the cross, they assisted him in going to the cross. That was always the plan. It just had to be the right time. Jesus was born at the right time. He died at the right time. He rose again at the right time and then engrafted you into the family of God just at the right time. Hallelujah. How many of you all are grateful for that? Grateful to be engrafted into the family of God to be a part of the divine family, to call God your father. You're part of the richest family in the universe. There is no lack in this family. There's no recession in this government. And you have already been taken care of because God says in his word that great and precious promises have been put on reserve in heaven for you. God anticipated your coming. So let's end. What do we know? God's timing is supreme. God's timing is supreme. What can we learn? By being submitted to God's timing, we will always see supernatural results. When we're submitted to his timing, we'll always see results that far surpass what we could do in our own natural strength. And lastly, what can we apply? Don't allow your belief to be infected by doubt. Don't allow your belief to be infected by doubt. Stay locked in. Stay locked in. Ask God for the grace to endure any inconvenience that you might be experiencing. And that's what it means to be moving at the pace of grace. You're moving with God's divine timing. He's giving you the strength and empowerment to endure any natural inconveniences. And you're looking forward to the promise being fulfilled that God has promised you. God's timing is always perfect, my friends. He never leaves any detail out. And when you are yielded to him, he will continue to strengthen you. He will continue to be with you. He will continue to fulfill every word he's spoken to you. And believing God allows you to continue to keep moving at the pace of grace. Come on, somebody give God a hand clap. If you're moving at the pace of grace, God is empowering you to be able to keep moving according to his divine timeline. Amen. That's good.